All right, what is going on, everybody? How you doing? Welcome to another episode of Talking Buffalo, part of the Blue Wire Network. I'm your host, Patrick Moran. Thank you, as always, for locking in, whether you're watching this on YouTube, whether you're listening to this via audio podcast form. Uh, I appreciate you all. It's been a good, solid week since we've had a podcast holiday weekend and all. Just a little bit of a break before the madness starts. Uh, While you're listening to this on Wednesday, we're taping this Tuesday morning. I'm joined by a recurring guest, good friend of mine, Anthony Marino from Buffalo Rumleys. What's going on, buddy? How you doing? Uh, did you enjoy your uh, little bit of an, an extended uh, Labor Day holiday weekend? Yeah, it was, a, it was a great holiday weekend. It's like, man, here we go now, too, right? Start of the season, kids yeah. going back to school. Brandon, it's going to be like 92 degrees here today. I don't know if it's like that in Buffalo or not, too, but it's just like... All right. Just in case you thought summer was over, the at least the temperature is uh, is keeping things in check for you. Yeah, you know it's funny. Again, we're taping this Tuesday morning for a, a Wednesday audio drop. Anyway, um, yeah, it's back to school day on uh, on Facebook. That's for sure. I went on there and I seen like a million pictures. Although I got to say, my friends are because I'm old and my friends are kind of getting old. So these little you know second and third grade pictures are all turning into high school and even in some cases. You know, some of the kids are off to college and stuff. Um, it's just funny how time flies when you, you know, in, in this day and age, your friend, you keep up with your friends more on social media than you probably do in person. And, uh, so, you know, to see these kids grow up in front of your eyes on social media is uh, pretty cool. But anyway, so you talked about this week being the start of the NFL season, of course. I woke up Monday morning, Labor Day, like r- ready to go. Like yeah. fired up, you know, it's been, it's been a long, long, long off season. And yeah, I woke up Monday, man, just really fired up for this week. Well, and it's funny too. I mean, and, and listen, I enjoy college football, usually a bit on the periphery this mm-hmm. weekend. It was like, okay, I watched uh, the Colorado TCU game, watched that entire game, which was, was crazy. a lot of fun, right? Like you kind of thinking to yourself, okay, is, is he going to live up to the hype? Is this more show than anything else? I watched LSU, Florida State. I watched uh, most of Duke Clemson last night, you know, again, at the time of recording on uh, Monday night. So you just, you know, it's like it starts to get you back into that that swing. But for me, that's just like a bit of the tune up of like, again, NFL starting this week. That's for me, that's the main event. I know there are some folks that love college football so much. But like I said, for for me, this is. It's go time now. Yeah, for sure. And by the time people are either watching this, maybe late on, on Tuesday night or listening, was it morning? We're like 36 to 48 hours away from the NFL kicking off Detroit at Kansas City on Thursday night. Uh, so today we're going to spend some time. Um, I got a couple of Bills related storylines that I think looking back now, maybe at the time it didn't feel that way. But as I'm, you know, in season mode right now, Maybe they were a little bit overrated, like overanalyzed, over talked about. Two of them I kind of want to hit on with you. Um, I want to go around the AFC today and talk about a handful of the expected contenders in this conference. And, you know, just like the Buffalo Bills, no team is without flaws. And we spent a lot of time worrying about the team that we cover here, the Buffalo Bills. I can bring up a point or two about each of these teams to make you feel maybe a little bit better. You're a Bills fan. You realize that we're not the only team, you know, that that's not without any flaws. A uh, couple of minutes worth of Buffalo Bills fantasy football talk. Now, I know a lot of people have already had their fantasy drafts, so I don't know how much this will be able to help them now. Um, in fact, I had my big one. I'm in three leagues. I had my big draft last night. I'll kind of run that by you. I know you're a fantasy football guy as well. But anyway, we'll spend a couple of minutes talking about how some of these Buffalo Bills might stack up fantasy wise, and then we'll do our. Uh, our finish the sentence. That's our, our weekly segment that we do. That's kind of highlights our, our personalities a little bit and also how old we're getting. So, you know, that's always, uh, it's always fun to do before we get into anything else though. Um, right at the top, I, I know that you're involved with a, uh, charity pick em contest. I put it up on the screen on the video side for people who are listening or watching, tell people about this project that you guys do. Yeah. So each year, uh, myself and Nate from the circling the wagons podcast, also part of Buffalo Rumblings. We kind of team up, pull together some prizes and do a fundraiser for the American Cancer Society. So we do a charity pick them. It is uh, easy to join. You just click on the link and it's on my uh, my Twitter account. It's my pinned tweet at Ant Marino. Um, you can sign up there and it's just, you know, there's a link to make a donation and, and 
donate however much you want. It doesn't make a difference how little or how much uh, you are able to give. And the winner at the end of the season will get a signed jersey from Gregory Rousseau. We got some swag from T Public. Oh, wow. Courtesy of uh, of Nate, we got some signed eight by tens from Daryl Talley uh, and Steve Christie. So you know, you just do some of that stuff. It's a, a fun excuse to get people to give. We know Bills fans are so charitable with what they do, uh, and this is like our fourth year in a row of doing it. And we have a lot of fun. And shout out to Nate because he was really the one that that really kind of gave the push to to make this happen. But uh, a lot of our podcast hosts participate and. Like we said, just a fun way to uh, to stay involved throughout the season. In my charity pick 'em contest, you're talking about for for fans who might be wondering what's going on. That that means you're picking the games for for the entire season, right? All the games. Yeah, you're picking all the games against the spread. Um, we did a survivor pool years back, and I think you know so many people got knocked out so soon. It's like, oh, this gives us a chance to kind of stay engaged with people a little bit more. So we made the switch to the pick them. So you're picking every game against the spread each and every week. And uh, and like we said, got some good prizes and we have a little fun. Yeah, it definitely sounds like fun. I'll put a link as well to that um, in the show notes for, for this podcast. You spoke of the survivor pool and how that could go too quickly. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna, I'm going to do one here. I've, I haven't done one before on Talking Buffalo. We're, I'm going to, and I'll put this as well, um, in the show notes, you can follow me on Twitter at Pat, Patrick Moran TV, and uh, I'll put the information there as well. But we're actually going to do a uh, survivor poll here, and it's open to anybody. It's completely free. Um, people just do the, you know, you know how survivor polls work, everybody. You pick the team once, you can't pick them again. Um, and I, I partnered up with Imperial Pizza, and um, they're going to give a, a food prize pack to the winner. So Something to look forward to. And again, if you don't live in the Buffalo area, you can gift. Them. Everybody knows somebody in this area, so you can get the two. So just a little fun, free thing. Anyway, like I said, I'll put that in the show notes. But we're going to have a, a Talking Buffalo Survivor Pool um, this season. All right, a little bit of news before we get into uh, our topics of today. Shortly before we started taping, the Bills restructured uh, the contracts of Tara Johnson and Ryan Bates. And that was to create $4.5 million in cap space. I know there might be some people who, you know, don't follow the the finances of the league and the team going on. I mean, like, oh, what are the Bills up to? They're up to they're up to something. There must be look at the sign, somebody or make a trade. Highly unlikely. Just want to let everybody know that. That is for salary cap operating purposes. The Bills were actually technically a little bit above the cap going into the season. So they had to make a couple moves. There were about four or five teams that had to do that, and the Bills were uh one of them. But anyway, like I said, it's just uh Something to know for cap wise. That's why the Bills did it. Let's 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 get into two. I think now again upon reflection, overrated storylines. Uh, the big one, of course, is the backup quarterback. Um, let me ask you this: Going into the season now, the preseason's over. A little bit of time to sit and relax. Are are you okay with Kyle Allen right now being the QB two? Because that certainly appears that it was good. It might've been a little bit of a mystery last week, but as things played out, you know, the bills, it, it feels like they've settled on Kyle Allen as the backup to Josh. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. For those of you on the video side, I'm, I'm smiling here because, you know, my good buddy, Pat, who was freaking out about the backup quarterback uh, a uh, few was. weeks ago. And, and granted, listen, you were at training camp, so you were witnessing it in person. So I, I will give you that because, wasn't seeing what what you were seeing but um yeah I think it's fine I mean I, listen the thing that I felt like would have been the most intriguing it's like okay the Bills were definitely in on Trey Lance if they had traded for him what would that have been right would it have been hey Kyle Allen's actually going to the practice squad and Trey Lance is going to be the backup because you know that's not a guy that you're going to to sneak through waivers in any way shape or form but am I fine with it yeah, I'm I'm fine with it, right? I think you look at it, he's got starting experience. He has produced in the NFL in the past. He's a backup quarterback for a reason. Um, there's not a lot of guys that I look at and think to myself like, oh, I wish we had him as a backup quarterback or this guy or that guy. Like, again, if, if he was good enough to, you know, to be a starter, he'd he'd be a starter. And I can look at it and say, and heaven forbid, if he has to play a game or two and that's the scenario between Stefan Diggs and Dawson Knox and Dalton Kincaid and Gabriel Davis and James Cook and Ken Dorsey and Sean McDermott in the defense that like 
the Bills will be able to compete. You know, obviously not as good as they would be with Josh Allen, but through some scheming and game planning. I mean, heck, I remember Matt Barkley coming in off the street and absolutely torching the Jets one week that I never would have thought that would have happened. So I try not to to freak out about this, but I'm I'm just more happy that it seems like maybe you've you've seen the light here on this and and you're okay with it. Well, you're watching on the YouTube side. This was me pretty much uh, thinking about the Buffalo Bills backup quarterback position. It's, it's the Ben Affleck meme with the Bills sweater on and the in the Zuba pants. Um, yeah, look. So I I got talked off the edge a little bit over the last few weeks by a couple of people, including you. And kind of maybe now I'm paying it forward a little bit, and I'm going to try to do the same. I went back over the last couple of years. In fact, Eric Quinn originally pointed this out, and I went back and, and looked for myself as well. The last three Super Bowl champions in the NFL right now, Kansas City Chiefs, uh, the L.A. Rams, and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And you go on their rosters, and, you, and you, you know, you're talking about three of the greatest quarterbacks arguing in the NFL ever, or at least two of the three anyway, with, with uh, Patrick Mahomes and Matthew Stafford and, and, and Tom Brady. And you're like, all right, well, these are great teams, great rosters. You let's yeah. look at the backup quarterbacks for these three, the last three Super Bowl champions: Chad Henney, John Wolford, and the great Blaine Gabbert. <laughs> Those are your three backup quarterbacks on the last three teams that have won a Super Bowl. So that makes me feel a little bit better. I will say this though: quarterback, backup quarterback. Hopefully, you, you hope it never matters. And yeah. rarely does it matter, but it can matter because when you go back and you look at the history of the league and teams that have won the Super Bowl, I could point out three teams to you that actually won a Super Bowl with a backup quarterback. Uh, the Washington Redskins did that in the late, I think it was the late 80s with Doug Williams. Doug Williams was not the starter on Washington. Jeff Hostetler yeah. was, got hurt later in the year. Doug Williams started the last two games and then the playoffs had a great run. You know, it was a historic run, but. Anyway, he was a backup quarterback. Jeff Hostetler, of course, the Bills fans know that all too well. Um, you know, Phil Simms got hurt. Jeff Hostetler stepped in. Giants won the Super Bowl. And then a handful of years ago with the Eagles, Nick Foles. So it can be done. Backup quarterbacks can have a big role on a team and can help you win a Super Bowl. But again, I just named three out of what, 51, 52, you know, teams that have that have won Super Bowls. But yeah, man, Chad Henney, John Wolford, Blaine Gabbert, last three quarterbacks, uh, backup quarterbacks on Super Bowl teams. That makes me feel better. No, and it, it, again, it's one of those pieces. It's like you don't want it to ever come to that point, but I don't look at any team in the NFL and say, hey, if their starter got hurt, oh, it's no big deal because their backup is going to be able to to lift them up. I mean, I can't I can't think of one off the top of my head if, Patrick Mahomes get down, get goes down. I don't look at Blaine Gabbard and say, "Oh, this is a guy like they have nothing to, to worry about." I don't even know who the backup is in Cincinnati behind Joe Burrow, but you know, chances are if he goes down or misses an extended period of time, like I'm not feeling good about what they have going on either. So it's, you know, Gardner Minshew is that one quarterback that you would talk about and say, like, "Hey, you'd feel okay." And I think that's more just because he's a flamboyant personality that you have a little fun with versus anything else. So let's just hope it, it's something we don't have to discuss this season at all. You know, what Kyle Allen's play looks like uh, for the right. Best. Right. Uh, Jake Browning, by the way, is the backup quarterback to uh, Joey Burrow in Cincinnati. Look, I, I think at the time, you know, we're, we're looking for things to talk about and we're finally at a point or I'm talking about like, you know, July and August where you could actually see football instead of just speculating on stuff. And yeah. it just, it wasn't pretty at camp. It just was not pretty at camp with Kyle Allen, but you know, again, kind of being a little more sensible. Now he's also learning a new system. There's lots of variables. And to your point, man, look, if the chief, if, if Mahomes, Burrow, if Lamar Jackson, Herbert, any of these guys suffer a significant injury, it's almost a lock that those teams are uh, that they're done as well. So yeah. anyway, we'll, we'll we'll talk about a couple of those teams in just a few minutes here. And then the other thing that I think has been a little bit overplayed a little bit is CB2. Um, you know, I'm going through a lot of storylines that we spent a lot of time talking about. And look, at the end of the day, when there's Christian Benford, who I think, I think is going to get that start on Monday night. Um, Dane Jackson or even Kyrie Elam. 
they're going to be fine. Uh, they're they're going to be, it's going to be adequate CB2 play. You know, I don't think any of those guys are going to light the world on fire, but I also don't sit, I'm not going to sit there and say, oh my God, these guys are just absolutely killing the Buffalo Bills in this defense. You know what I'm saying? So I, because of that, I think maybe this was a little bit overblown as well, this competition. Well, and, and it's overblown because you've got three guys in the competition that have actually shown that they can be a starting cornerback. Right again, it's not one of those where, good gosh, we drafted Kyer Elam, all the eggs were in that basket, it didn't work out, and it's a failure, and there's there's not the proper depth there to, to right. make it work. I definitely overreacted about it, though. I mean, you, you know, you think to this offseason, the time I spent talking about it, whether on social media, on my show, it was just a little bit of the confusion of even just a, listen, you've got this rookie, like, just throw him into the fire and have him work work through some of those issues. But again, it's different when you have two other people part of the competition that have shown that they could play at a starting level. Like I'm not saying a Pro Bowl level. I'm not saying that these guys are, you know, playing as good as a, a first round draft pick should be. That's not it. But yeah, it, it would be overblown if it was along the lines of there's no one else to play there. And it's just like this is a glaring weakness. It's not a glaring weakness for the team. And that makes it different. And it's really just more about the part. And, you know, we spend so much time doing mock drafts and talking about prospects. So when you draft someone in the first round and they don't step in and become a starter in their rookie season and then they're not a starter in their second season, people start to freak out about that. I mean, there's been so much conversation around the Boogie Basham trade and everything with that. And we talked about that last week. Like, Okay, you just take a step back from it, though, and it's just like, okay, Kyer Elam has shown that he can play in the NFL. He's done some good things. If he's a backup for you, there are worse problems that you have on this team right now. So, yeah, little, but even as I say, like, no need to overreact. My blood pressure is rising as I talk. Uh, 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 mine too, a little bit. You know, look, in, in regards to Kyer Elam, too, I think the situation in the team that he plays with matters. This is a good team. This is a, a contending team. So you're not just going to yeah. throw a guy out there because of his draft status and see if he sinks or swims. Do you know what I'm saying? Like if this yeah. was the Arizona Cardinals or the Houston Texans and you got a first round pick invested in your corner, you better throw his ass out there. You're not winning yeah. anyway. Let's see what you got with him. But, you know, for a team with Super Bowl, legitimate Super Bowl aspirations like the Buffalo Bills, you know, if you throw Kyrie Elam out there because he's your first round pick and he's just not working out and he's hurting you a lot, then, uh, you know, he might be the reason why you, your team uh, doesn't win. It's not that I, I don't even think he's that bad. It, it's just, he's just inconsistent. And it's, that is, I'm not going to lie, that is, you talk about blood, you know, getting your uh, blood pressure going, kind of feeling the same way right now talking about him. But you also were, a couple weeks ago, you, you mentioned this on the show. I'm not going to say that you were the first one, but you, what you, when you said it, it certainly resonated with me the most, and it stuck with me. And that's the whole McCargo Kyle Williams thing. You know, if Christian Benford turns out to be a really good corner, I don't, you know, in some ways I am saying it. Like, who cares? If, if Kyle Reelan was a first yeah. round, if he turns out to be a first round bust, but Christian Benford turns out to be a really solid, you know, NFL starting caliber corner, then I'm all right with it. It'll always suck. And you'll always say, well, the Bills, you know, they could have drafted somewhere else and maybe done better. But, then we get into that whole, you could say the same thing about 31 other teams, you know, that miss. Nobody hits on every single draft pick, but it could be worse is what I'm saying. And that's why I feel like this storyline might be a little bit overblown because if Elam's not it, but Christian Benford is, or if Dane Jackson's adequate enough, then it's not that big of a deal. You know, the one thing that will be interesting about this scenario, though, this year, right, with Sean McDermott calling the plays as opposed to Leslie Frazier, like how different will things be with the defense? Like one of the frustrating things with Frazier was always that bend but don't break scenario. And it's like, hey, yeah, we'll we'll let you catch a six yard pass and then we're going to wrap you up like, great, you got six yards like we're confident we're you know, we're going to hold you and that's fine. Um is McDermott going to have that same philosophy with his cornerbacks? Is he going to be a little bit more aggressive? Does that give someone like Elam a chance to work into the lineup? Or is that where Christian Benford is really more of a best of both worlds, right? He's got a, a bit of Kyer Elam in him, a bit of Dane Jackson, but those two guys are probably on the opposite ends of the spectrum. I'll be curious to see how that plays out and how aggressive those corners are versus 
playing a little bit softer coverage that we saw under Leslie Frazier. So it's a topic that I don't think is going to go away, but I hope that it's not a topic that we have to talk about too much more because whoever gets the job, I hope just plays well. For for what it's worth, I, I'm pretty high on Christian Bedford. I like him. And it's a little weird that we're what, you know, four, four and a half, five days away from the Bills season opener and we're still not 100% sure who's going to line up out there but week to week matchup to matchup there might not be and we've said this before there might not even be necessarily a CB2 it might be who the Bills are playing that week and what style that offense is might be a week to week thing you know just kind of like middle linebacker might end up being the same thing uh, as well Pat I don't expect there to be an announcement on who the starter is at either position until they're going through the, uh, you know, the headshot introductions on Monday. <laughs> on ESPN. And then we'll be like, oh, I guess Tyrell Dodson is starting or Christian Benford is starting. But until we get that, I'm I'm not expecting anything. Before we run into the break real quick here, having, again, time to reflect on this summer with, with the Bills, is there anything else that you're looking at and like, wow, we, whether it's you and I or whether it's yourself on on your own show or just – things you've read and heard that like, you know what, maybe we spent a little bit too much time dissecting something that wasn't really all that uh, urgent. No, I don't think it was anything that was too, too urgent, but I think it, you know, when you talk about the wide receivers, that is probably something that there was so much conversation around because of DeAndre Hopkins, right? And is this something that the bills will do? And we talked to, you know, how he would fit in, what could snap counts look like? Well, what about this one? What about that one? I mean, I think if Deontay Hardy and Trent Sherfield play well, and you know, and of course Dalton Kincaid, what he will bring to the to the team and that eleven and a half personnel as they've uh, dubbed it, you know, we spent a lot of time <laughs> talking about DeAndre Hopkins, and uh, you know, it made for some fun conversation to talk about arguably a future hall of famer and the potential for him to to come to buffalo um so that would be the only other storyline around the wide receivers and there was a lot of a lot of breath that went into <laughs> deandre hopkins yeah absolutely it, i mean in fairness though deandre hopkins kind of fueled some of that himself totally. you know but on social media i think those are the only two cb2 and, and qb2 might be the two overblown uh, storylines. I will say though, probably now as we're getting ready, then I don't want this is not going to turn into a build season preview episode right now or anything. But I will say, over the course of training camp in the preseason, probably the one area where I changed my mind the most, maybe you know how I feel now as opposed to how I felt maybe in the middle of July, is coming into camp. I was really, really high on Khalil Shakir. I thought he was a lock to be that starting slot receiver. And I, and I felt like he was ready to emerge as a potential, even use the word breakout candidate. But after watching camp in the preseason and seeing how he's kind of slipped down a little bit, I've become, uh, well, it's kind of like that McCargo Kyle Williams comparison again, because I just really have grown to like Trent Shurfield a lot. I think he's going to have a big role on this team, whether he's that third receiver, whether he's playing for Gabe Davis or Stephon Diggs, if they need a blow or, you know, one of them go down for a while. He could play the outside. He could play the inside. I was really impressed with him throughout the summer. He won me over. And I just feel like Khalil Shakir might be one of those guys who, at least to start the season, is not going to be dressing on game day. Or if he does, he's not going to be uh, playing a lot. And then I agree with you, too. The other thing, which I think we have not seen much of at all this summer or the preseason, completely by design, is that 11 and a half personnel. I think you're going to see a whole hell of a lot of Dalton Kincaid and Dawson Knox out of the field together. I think when they're out there, the Bills will be at their you know most unpredictable. They can run the ball. They can throw the ball. He can play many positions on offense. Kincaid, whether it's a slot, H-back, split out wide, in line, tight. I think there's a whole uh, bevy of things that the Bills could do offensively when they're both on the field. And that's, that's one thing that maybe, you know, on the other hand, we haven't talked enough about because we haven't seen a lot of it other than you're just your basic standard 12 personnel with them, which was – by design, I think, anyway, very vanilla, you know? Well, it should make the Bills' offense unpredictable. There's so much conversation around Ken Dorsey, too, and, like, heading into mm-hmm. to year two and improvements that can take place there. It'll be exciting to see what that looks like and hopefully in uh, week one against the New York Jets. All 
right, I'm back with Anthony Marino from Buffalo Rumblings. All right, so we spent a little bit of time talking about some of the, like, overblown storylines with the Buffalo Bills or things that might have been not talked about enough. Let's spend a couple of minutes here on, on today's episode kind of going around the league a little bit. Again, if you're the Buffalo Bills, you are you were worried, you know, some of our worries were backup quarterback, CB2, middle linebacker, which I do still think is a legitimate uh, concern until I see otherwise. Um, maybe right tackle. Anyway, the Bills are not without flaws, but neither are any of the teams right now around the AFC that are considered contenders. So let's kind of go around with some of the teams anyway that people reject to be contenders. And we'll start with the, you know, the AFC East. Uh, the New York Jets, you know, Aaron Rodgers, of course, the big pickup in New York. But if you're a Jets fan right now and you have concerns, uh, I feel like Aaron Rodgers actually could be one of them. You know, are you getting the Aaron Rodgers like Tom Brady when he went to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Is he that final piece to put you over the hump? Or are you getting a guy like, at least last year anyway, you know, Russell Wilson going to the Denver Broncos, you know, a really good player, a little bit long in the tooth that was supposed to be a great player for a team that was considered, you know, considered a contender, but you know, really fell off last year. I, I, I think if you're a Jets fan, I feel like that's a, a fair question to ask right now, to at least to ponder a little bit. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, let's put it this way. I would agree, but if I were a Jets fan, I've got a lot of friends that are Jets fans. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd be feeling pretty good right now, right? I mean, you're heading into the season any year, right? You're zero and zero. You're optimistic heading into this. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, you know, we we contended for the playoffs last year, got off to a decent start with Zach Wilson and Mike White as our quarterback. So, like, even if Aaron Rodgers is, you know, 75% of his MVP sure. caliber Aaron Rodgers, we're going to be okay. And to his credit, right, like, he's doing and saying all the right things. Like, he is embracing the team. They are embracing his leadership, and it's like, I mean, obviously it's very different than what we saw as he was exiting Green Bay and just kind of the the pettiness that that he can have with things. So at least from a honeymoon standpoint in this year, he's doing and saying all the right things. So if I were a Jets fan, I'd feel excited. Um, I look at this team, and it's just like, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't look at the Jets and take them lightly in any way, shape, or form because I think he's that type of player – that it's just like whatever he can muster again from that pettiness standpoint to uh, to kind of stick it to Green Bay and show that he's not washed up or he's still you know got something left at least early on in the season I think you'll see that whether or not he starts to decline as the season goes on but at least early on I I think with the uh, the hype train if I were a Jets fan I'd feel okay I would too I am if I'm a Jets fan I'm really excited um, I agree with you about Aaron Rodgers look. If I'm a Jets fan, I'm like, we've played, we beat the Buffalo Bills last year and yeah. we played them very tough in Buffalo and we played them very tough two games a year before. The Jets have played the Bills very tough. The Bills have struggled a little bit with that Jets defense. And I'll tell you, um, who, who's that new safety? DJ Reed. He said that he thinks the Jets could be an historically good defense this year. He can talk about like the 85 Bears, 2000 Ravens type of level. I don't know about all that. But they, they they have a good team. Quentin Williams is one of the best defense tackles in the NFL. Carl Lawson is a beast. Jermaine Johnson, I like that kid a lot. C.J. Mosley, they're very tough up front. And then you got Sauce Gardner, who's already become one of the best corners in the NFL. I don't think there's a lot of question marks on that defense. Now, we're talking about potential flaws with Aaron Rodgers. I would say the offensive line, you know, you could say the same thing about the Bills, I'm sure, too, or some other teams, too. But, uh. The offensive line, I look at this team and, you know, Dwayne Brown on the left side, I'm looking, I'm looking at their depth chart right now. Tomlinson at, at guard, Connor McGovern, which, by the way, some people say the good Connor McGovern. I remember that. But he's, he's the center for the New York Jets. Um, Vera Tucker, who I do like a lot of guard, and then Becton, a uh, tackle I don't like much um, at all. But Garrett Wilson, dude, Garrett Wilson, he was a top six pick, by the way, in our fantasy football draft. Lesson. I'm going to get to that in a, in a few minutes. That was like, that's high. I was trying to get him. I'm like, I can get him early second round. This guy's going to be a steal. Anyway, that, that, it's a loaded roster. It's deep. I think the Jets are for real. But um, yeah, it, I, it comes down to Aaron Rodgers. And like I said at the beginning, is he Tom Brady for Tampa or is he Russ Wilson for Denver? That's what it's going uh, gonna to come down to. What about their divisional rivals, co-rivals, I should say, Miami? You look at this team, 
Is it all about, well, not all about, but largely about Tua for you? I, I mean, Tua is definitely a big part. And I, I say this, right? And it's like, I, I realize as Bills fans, it's like, oh, you're supposed to hate the Jets. You're supposed to hate the Dolphins and everything that has to go with them. Like, you know, for Tua Tagovailoa, like for everything that he has gone through last year, I like the guy. I, I really do, right? And I don't say it. Maybe I like him because I'm not as threatened by him as like a quarterback. You know, it's not like a Patrick Mahomes or somebody that you've been sort of dealing with all this time, but it's just like, I think he's doing a good job with that team. I mean, Tyreek Hill certainly had a good season last year where people are like, I'm not sure if that's going to work out with what he is as a quarterback and the type of receiver that he is. Um, the, the thing that is interesting to me that I feel like is a little overblown right now is the Dolphins defense. Um, Vic Fangio coming in, I mean, certainly has had a track record of success in the past, but not so much in recent years, right? So as you kind of mm -hmm. look at this, it's just like, eh, I'm, I'm not 100% sold on that. Certainly some talented players. You talk about Jalen Phillips and others, but like Jalen Ramsey being out through at least December, December, potentially for the season, like, you know, that's someone that was filling a big void for you and now he's no longer there. So um, certainly the Dolphins can be good. I mean, you, you talk about their coach and Mike McDaniel, again, a guy that's, did some really good things last year. So the quarterback, it all comes down to him, though. I mean, with any team, but like with his injury history, you just have to think like, can he stay healthy this year? And I think that's what has people maybe hedging on the Dolphins a little bit. You know, I want to circle back to the Jets for one second because I was looking it up. According to Caesars, the Vegas betting line, the Jets are 16 to 1 to win the Super Bowl, 9 to 1 to win the AFC, and 2 and a half to 1 to make the playoffs. Miami, 25 to 1 to win the Super Bowl, 12 to 1 to win the AFC, and 3 to 1 to make the playoffs. I do hate the Miami Dolphins. I got no problem saying it, but I also could be objective, but I'm not going to sound like I'm being objective right here. I think Miami's the third best team in the AFC East. I really do. I think Tua is a big question mark at quarterback. You suffer, you know, you get a couple of head injuries, and it's just something you're always going to have to worry about. But even if you took that away, even if you took away the potential health of Tua, which is a big deal. I don't know them. Look, Miami's got Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle, and that's your best. Well, maybe along with Cincinnati, that's your best one, two wide receiver combo in the NFL. I don't think there's really much to die in that. I think Miami's got pretty good running backs. Um, they got some good players on defense, but I, you know, I just don't think that defense, I think that defense is more of a paper defense. You talked about big bad Joe, and I agree with you. Look, I don't think Bradley Chubb's all that great. The Miami traded for him and gave up a lot to give him, paid him a lot of money. Bradley Chubb is, I I like Greg Rizzo as much as I do Bradley Chubb, maybe even more. And the Bills didn't have to give up stupid shit to go get him. Um, Eli Apple starting at corner, I think he sucks, and I, and I don't like him, but I also don't even think he's good. Xavier Howard's still a pretty good corner, but I think his best days are behind him. They, they traded for Jalen Ramsey, who got cooked last year by Stephon Diggs. But anyway, he's hurt, so he's not going to be playing for a big chunk of the season. I just, I don't know, man. I think they got a couple good players on defense, but I just don't think this defense is that good. And I don't think their offensive line is very good either. So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of, Miami's a very top heavy team. Like I think the Jets are deeper. I know the Buffalo Bills are deeper. I think Miami's got some really high end star players like Javon Holland. And like I said, the receivers and Christian Wilkins, I, don't, I mean, don't like the guy, but he's a hell of a football player. I just, I feel like Miami's a very top heavy team. That's yeah. And I, but I think a difference with them too, where maybe you looked at them the past few years and it was just like, okay, this is a team we don't have to worry about. Right. I mean, especially when Brian Flores was the head coach and it just seemed like the bills could do whatever they wanted uh, against the dolphins for, for those years, you know, then you come into it last year and it's just like, you know, listen, regardless of the weather or whatever happened, it's like the bills lost that game down in Miami. They lost the game. Right. It was whatever the factors sure. were that went into it. So it's just like, OK, this is not the team that you're just going to roll over anymore. I mean, granted, they put up like 500 some yards of offense in that game. I mean, they were moving the ball at will. They just couldn't get into the end zone. But, you know, the Dolphins are are legit. And I think when you look at teams and you look at franchises, the difference is right now you have players and free agents that could say like, Hey, I'm excited to go play for the jets. I'm excited to go play for the dolphins. Sure. That was not the case a few years ago. 
right? When things would, would come about. So, you know, you think back to Anthony Barr, like, oh, wait, I'm signing with the Jets. Like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. And kind of rescinding on that, that verbal agreement that came through. And, you know, now you've got these teams and listen, you could say the same thing about the Buffalo Bills. Nobody was wanting to go to Buffalo before. Now, all of a sudden it's a destination for, you know, free agents or veterans that might be able to, you know, take a friendly type of contract. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like, Whoever comes out of the AFC East, that's going to mean something. And even to your point, when you said like, oh, I see the Dolphins is the third best team. I mean, you could have Buffalo go 12 and five, the Jets go 11 and six, and the Dolphins go 10 and seven. Sure. I mean, it can be a dogfight to to that point. It's, you know, not like in years past where it was like, yeah, the Patriots went 14 and two and uh, the second place team was nine and seven and the right third place team was five and whatever. So. I'm rambling wanna, now, but you know what I'm saying. Sure, and I don't want to be too dismissive of the Miami Dolphins because I think the line between first and third in the AFC East is much, much slimmer than it's yeah. been over the last few years, for sure. The Miami Dolphins can win the AFC. There's no question about it. The AFC East, for sure. Um, Kansas City Chiefs, oh, by the way, to your point, uh, in terms of like destination, now, and it's weird saying that with the Bills, but it is true because you look at guys like Puna Ford and uh, Leonard Floyd, and Christian Kirksey, after he got cut by Houston just last week, these guys come here. Those are guys that would not have been Buffalo Bills sure, maybe six years ago, you know, a half dozen years or so ago, unless the Bills are going to pay them big money. And the Bills did not pay any of those guys big money. Now it's about winning for Buffalo. So that, of course, is great. All right, the Kansas City Chiefs are and should be the AFC favorites to win it all. They're 6-1 to one in, by Caesars right now to win the Super Bowl, 3.5-1 to one to win the AFC and minus 500 to uh, make the playoffs. Um, I, I'll say this. If you're a Kansas City Chiefs fan and you have concerns, Chris Jones has to be at the top. This guy is a stud. And I'll tell you, dude, going back to that 2020 AFC championship game where the Bills got smacked, Chris Jones was probably the best player on the field that day. I don't know how much yeah. you remember that nightmare of a game. But do you remember what he did to John Feliciano and Mitch Morris and anyone who the Bills put in front of him? He just ate him up. Chris Jones is a significant player. Let me throw up a stat because this blew my mind. Um, I'm going to throw it up on the screen here. Okay. As, a, as Chiefs Chris Jones continues to hold out, look at his impact. Here's how much he means in his defense. With Chris Jones on the field, the Kansas City Chiefs are first in the NFL in quarterback pressure percentage. With Chris Jones, without him on the field, I should say, they're 28th. Over, and this is over the last five years. So the Chiefs literally pressure the quarterback more than any team in the NFL when Chris Jones is on the field. And when he's not on the field, they are 28th. Is that, that's, that's a crazy stat of how you want to talk about a player being an MVP caliber player and what he means to a team. That, that says it all, man. So I don't know, man. Chris Jones, by the way, He's still holding out, and I, I guess if you're a Chiefs fan, when is he coming back? And if he misses a handful of games, do the Chiefs lose a couple early, and does that ultimately cost them, you know, the number one seed, which matters? That's probably my biggest concern if I'm a Chiefs fan. He should hold out for the entire season, I think. I like, think so, too. Definitely not play, especially <laughs> especially when they play Buffalo. He should definitely still be holding out for that game. But seriously, man, this guy means that much to this defense and to that organization. It's crazy. You know, it's interesting with the Chiefs and right there, that team that you're just waiting for them to, I'll say like put up a subpar year, right? Where things just don't seem to be working out for them or they, you know, have a couple of games where things don't bounce their their way. And mm -hmm. many folks thought that was going to happen last year, right? They traded away Tyreek Hill. Sure, you still have Travis Kelsey, but you looked at their wide receiver room. It's just like, yeah, you know, Juju Smith-Schuster and you got – MVS and you got oh Sky Moore you drafted but like oh and guess what they were still they were still great and you know it's like what's that point that's going to come with them and I remember feeling that way with Tom Brady and the Patriots where it would just be like oh well this guy left or this took place or you know something like when are they just going to not have everything bounce their way and you know Chris Jones is a is a big piece. Now again, he doesn't affect the offensive side of the ball. We've seen them score points at at will. So you know you talk about that. You look at Travis Kelsey, thirty four years old. You have to think at some point he's going to start to slow down. But 
until it happens, I'm, I'm not going to expect it. You know, until you see it, I'm not going to believe it. That team's just, I mean, they're so reliant. You know what? We said Miami is top heavy. Well, so are the Chiefs, but their top heavy guys, I mean, are just as good as it gets. Obviously, Mahomes and Kelsey yeah. are, they're the best at their positions. And Chris Jones might be the best. He's, if there's anyone on a defensive line who's right there with Aaron Donald, to me, it's Chris Jones. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the Chiefs as a defense overall, I don't really think they're all that good. And if they don't have Chris Jones, I think they're bad. So if you're a Chiefs fan, you're like, well, we're going to have to score 40 points a game, you know, to be a top seed. So that's a, a legitimate concern uh, if you're a Chiefs fan. The Bengals, this might be a little bit controversial because I, I really want to say it's Buffalo. But to me, I think the Cincinnati Bengals might have the best one to 53 man roster right now um, in the NFL. I just don't see any holes anywhere. I really don't. And uh, they are 10 to one to win the Super Bowl, five to one to win the AFC, minus 350 to make the playoffs. If you're a Bengals fan, just like I think if you're a Bills fan, it, it pretty much starts and, and it ends with Joe Burrow, who, who did have an injury already this summer with the knee. Can he stay healthy? Will he be healthy? To me, that's the, the end all be all. When it comes to the Bengals, if he's out, they're done. If he's in, if he's healthy, they're 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 definitely right there. You know, this is such a, a hard um question to answer because like put yourself in the shoes of a Bengals fan right now. And Jamar Chase has talked about it. You know, if it was the Bills and Josh Allen was in this position, do you want Josh Allen to play week one, week two? Or are you just like take as much time, get back to a hundred percent? No need to rush because Honestly, as much as we can say it's about, oh, you got to win the AFC East or the one seed makes such a big difference. Honestly, it's like, you know what makes a difference? Making the playoffs and being healthy in the playoffs. It does. And I don't know if Joe Burrow should play in, in week one against the, the Browns. It's a divisional game, so there's some added pressure with that. But that's a tough scenario to be in because here's a guy. I mean, he's he's dealt with injuries and things in the past and has missed um, – significant time like you know do you shut him down for a couple of weeks and just get him back to a hundred percent I don't know I mean I'm I'm sure I know if 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 there was a situation with the Bills yes I would want Josh Allen to play there's no question with that but if I was thinking with my head it would be like this week one game against the Jets is not that important when you're talking about an 18 week season um you know the Bengals maybe more than anybody they're battle tested so if you got to miss a couple games early in the year, and even if it means maybe not winning the top seed in the AFC, and you ultimately got to go on the road in the playoffs, the Bengals have done that. You know, they're, in a, they're an experienced team with a, a great leader in Burrow. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. I wouldn't rush him back whatsoever. Um, but that's a legitimate concern. Like I said, as Joe Burrow goes, so go the Bengals. You know, we can skip the Ravens for the most part and say the same thing. By the way, I, I think teams are sleeping on the Ravens, or people, I should say, are completely sleeping on the Ravens because they could be really good. When Lamar Jackson's in that lineup, Baltimore's a, a top team uh, in the AFC. By the way, they're 20 to 1 to win the Super Bowl, 12 to 1 to win the AFC, minus 160 uh, to make the playoffs. But they, they can run the ball. They always have a good offensive line. They got Odell Beckham. They drafted Zay Flowers. They always have a good defense. And uh, so, yeah, it comes down to Lamar. And they also got a new offensive coordinator, uh, Todd Moken. Are they going to pass the ball more, I guess, is, is what I'm saying. They got weapons now, and supposedly this new offense is going to be a little more pass-friendly where they've been a little too reliant on the run. But, yeah, do, do you feel like kind of like, you know, us talking, you doing your show, you talking to your buddies, your your football buddies, you got to feel like it's all Buffalo, Kansas City, Cincinnati. Really, Baltimore's not even really mentioned much at all. I think they should be. They don't get mentioned a ton. I feel like they should be. Um, I feel like there's a lot of teams that should be, right? Again, you talk about the AFC. It's like, man, there is, there's a lot of good teams. And not even from the standpoint of just like who's going to make the Super Bowl, but just when you talk about making the playoffs. I mean, what what is it? Seven teams are going to make the playoffs. Mm -hmm. You can rattle off 10 teams that you're expecting to have a good year. You know, there's going to be good teams that do not make it this season, and that's going to be tough for some fan bases because the AFC is just stacked while you look at the NFC and you just don't don't have that same feeling. Yeah, I agree, man. And uh, one other team, too, that I wanted to mention was the Chiefs. Or not the Chiefs, the Chargers. I'll tell you, if, if I'm a betting guy and I want to bet some odds to, like, win some money, the Chargers are 22-1 to 1 to win the Super Bowl. 
that's more than double what the Bengals are. The, the, the Chargers feel like a team that is, uh, you know, on paper, it just looks so good. They got a great quarterback. Austin Eckler is one of the best running backs. They got Mike Williams. They drafted Quinn and Johnson. Tons of weapons. They got Khalil Mack and Bosa on defense during James. There's a lot of talent on this team. Um, Herbert being healthy, of course, is the other one. And then the, in their case with the Chargers, it's coaching Staley, man. I mean, seems like he just he coaches his worst when the games matter the most. So if you're a Chargers fan, I'm like, I think you got to overcome your coaching. I look at the Chargers and it's just like, until they show me something, I, I'm not buying it. And I say that of just That's like, they, they've had some historic collapses in the playoffs. You look at that roster, the amount of talent, you said it yourself, Khalil Mack, Joey Bosa, like this team should be great and yeah. they are not. And it's like, you know, maybe it is coaching. Maybe it's the quarterback, right? It's one thing to put up statistics and it's another thing to to actually make plays when it's when it's needed. Um, I just don't see it with them. And maybe they prove, you know, maybe they take that next step. Um, but they just feel to me a bit like, I don't want to say like the 2019 bills, right? Where it's like, hey, it's a good story. People are starting to get on board. This quarterback looks like he's something. He can make some plays but he's not making the plays at the time when uh when it needs to happen. So it's uh yeah, I mean, listen, the Bills play him late this season, you're going to go into that game, you're going to be uh on pins and needles a bit, right? Cuz you know it's a high-powered offense, you know they can make plays. The Bills could lose that game traveling west, whatever it is, but it's like a Super Bowl contender. I don't know if I'd put my money on them. You know, there's if there's one team that you can relate to the the injury bug as much as the Buffalo Bills did last year. It's the Chargers the yeah. last couple of years. They just get so many crippling injuries. Um, all right, so that that's our take like around the top received top teams. Anyway, I didn't mention Jacksonville. I absolutely should have included them. Maybe I would say if you're a Jacksonville fan, you just you haven't done it yet. You know what I mean? You got to get out there and you got to do it in the playoffs when it matters. You don't have that playoff experience. I I kind of feel like uh, that matters some. Anyway, those are the, like the top teams in the AFC. No team is without flaws, as we just talked about. If you're wondering, everyone out there watching or listening, the Bills are 9-1. to And this is per Caesars, by the way, as of this morning, actually. The Bills are 9-1 to to win the Super Bowl, which is the second best odds among all these teams. They're 4.75-1 to to win the AFC, minus 300 to make the playoffs. Do you have, I, I'm asking you, if, do you know or do you want to take a guess what the over-under is for wins for the Buffalo Bills? at Caesars right now? Uh, I think I might have heard this before, but it would have been a while ago. I'm going to guess it's 11. It's 10 and a half as of right now. Okay. So if you're betting on the Bills, 11 games is what it would take. I could see that, 11 and 6. Come on. That's an easy bet. It's a chump bet. I, I don't know that, that it's... it's <laughs> you, you look at the, the schedule is tougher this year, right? It you is. can At least going back into things last year and thinking... You would have thought the games against the Jets and the Dolphins, you would have been four and zero. You know, you ended up going two and two, but you know now it's like okay, you go out to to San Diego, you play the Chiefs again. You're, you know, you're playing some tough teams, right? You go to, this is not a schedule you look at and you take lightly. Agreed. I'm still betting the over though. <laughs> <laughs> still betting the over. I I don't. Short of injuries, really hurting this football team. I just. I don't see a scenario where they don't at least go uh, 11 and six. I just think they're, they're too good. All right, let's spend a couple minutes before we get to our finish the sentence segment to wrap up. I want to talk fantasy football for a minute. And again, I know this is late in the game and a lot of people probably already have drafted their team. How many are, do you, um, I know you do fantasy football. Are you in multiple leagues or do you just do one? I do three leagues. I mean, there is one league that is my, main league though and Me i find that with a lot of guys right like oh here's the one i've been in it's like our 25th year you know oh, wow or like you know a, a high percentage of the the guys right that are in, same guys each and every year with it so there's the one league that i say you know like i'm talking to my wife like that i care about the most and then there's the other ones that i do that yeah you still get competitive but it's you don't you don't hold that same amount of pride when you uh when you win those leagues for sure i'm also in three one of them is with a, a large group of friends um this is we've been doing that for as long as you guys but 13 years so okay. there's that one then i'm in a, a media dynasty league uh that's just for shit talking purposes that's all like buffalo local and uh alternative or 
or mainstream media. And, and that trader, Marcel Luis Jacques, is still uh, he's still in the league. Joe Marino won that league last year, by the way. I joined, I took over for Matt Marino's team last year. So this is my second year uh, doing that. And then there's one at Imperial Pizza. I don't even want to say how much money it is because it's a lot more money than I usually do. Usually we do, you know, 20 to 50 bucks. It's enough to keep you interested for the year and, you know, you have a good time. This one is like significantly more than that. So you talk about one that you care about. This is definitely one uh, that I care about the most. Let me throw my team up because I, we just drafted on Monday night and I'll run through it real quick. Uh, I had the 10th pick. It's a 12 team league. Um, Joe Burrow's my quarterback. Barkley and Gibbs are my running backs. Lamb and George Pickens from Pittsburgh are my receivers. Dallas Godert is my tight end. James Conner is my flex. Saints defense. Dicker the kicker. Uh, <laughs> Chargers is my kicker. Bench guys, I'm not going to go through the whole ones that I... But Traylon Burks and, and Dalton Schultz are two bench guys I like a lot. Anthony Richardson, the rookie quarterback, is, is my backup uh, quarterback. I don't know, buddy. You're, you're a fantasy guy. What, what do you think when you look at this expert? Do I have a chance to, to win some money here? No, I think you've got a chance. I mean, listen, your your running backs are ridiculously strong with Barkley and at least, you know, expectations for Gibbs are uh, are incredibly high there. So you look at that as a good thing. C.D. Lamb gives you that surefire wide receiver one. So that's, uh, you know, that's a true positive. And I love your George Pickens uh, pick, you know, not yeah, knowing like when it. you took him, but sort of piecing things together based on the other guys that you have. I mean, he has that rapport with Kenny Pickett, and I think that's a guy that at least expectations are high. And if that ends up being a hit for you, he can be a, what they call a league winner. Yeah, I took uh, – so I had the 10th pick of this draft, and it was a 12-team league. And I took Bar Barkley and Bijan Robinson somehow both ended up on the, on the board at 10. And I just went with Barkley. I just got a feeling as good as Robinson's going to be, that maybe he's just a little bit overhyped. So I took uh, the proven guy. I will say, in round two, I wanted to get Josh Allen coming back to me, but he went one pick before me. And then I took CeeDee Lamb. I pivoted. I ended up taking Burrow uh, in the third. I would say there's four quarterbacks. That, and today's fantasy football is so different, too, if. Because back in the day, it was just, you know, the Brady's, the, the, the Peyton Manning's throw a lot of yards, but they don't run for anything. Now quarterbacks be more than ever with fantasy football because of how many yards they can run for. So Josh Allen hurts Mahomes and Lamar Jackson. To me, those are your four quarterbacks that are in their own tier. And I wanted one of those four. And I tried to, to wait to the third round after I missed out on Josh and uh, it, it didn't end up uh, working out. But for the Bills. Let's let's just run through a handful of Bills guys right now, and I'll tell you where they rank in terms of uh, Yahoo. And tell me if you agree with this or not. So Josh Allen is the third quarterback in Yahoo in the rankings, the pre-draft rankings, behind Hurts and Mahomes, 33rd overall player. Again, I just kind of said it. You kind of feel like those three, you could take any of those three early yeah. and you're good. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it makes sense. I mean, listen, you look at it. I mean, Jalen Hurts, I understand – as far as being dual threat, that offense seemed unstoppable last year. I mean, so many situations, too. They were just blowing teams out. He didn't even really have to pass the ball in the fourth quarter of games. Like, there are some statistics of just, like, they were basically, like, and trying to ice the game in fourth sure. quarter. So, you know, you look at that, I think him being third, it's fine. And you could pick, go with any of those three, and it's not the wrong pick. Agreed. Um, I got Josh Allen in our friends league, so I, I do have him in one of the three. Uh, running back, James Cook, 22nd overall among running backs, 53rd overall. Guys that ranked ahead of him in the rankings on Yahoo include Damian Pierce, J.K. Dobbins, Miles Sanders, Kenneth Walker, Brees Hall, and Cam Akers. I don't get Brees Hall being ahead of James Cook right now. First of all, he's coming off an injury. Second of all, I got Dalvin Cook with the Jets as well. That just sounds like a split. All over the place. I feel like, again, maybe uh, I got some rose colored glasses on a little bit, but I feel like being only the twenty second running back when he's going to be on an offense as good as Buffalo and be the featured back. I feel like that's too low. You know what, though? Here's the thing: he was he was a high riser this off season. So you mm -hmm. can look and early on, it was well, is he really going to be that lead back, or is it going to be him and Damian Harris a little bit of a timeshare and what that looks like? So you had someone like uh, like James Cook. He probably, you said 22nd. He probably moved up about 
15 spots sure based on where he was early on and uh i also do a bunch of uh underdog fantasy i don't know if you do any of those best ball drafts that they have a, a lot of fun and in the preseason and doing those early on i was getting james cook like late like real late and really? it was just one of those pieces where it's like okay here's a guy that can be a difference maker you know you're doing a draft in june nobody's really looking at the Buffalo Bills depth chart at that time, like you or I would be. So, uh, so for that standpoint, I, I hope that he pays off, but listen, running back 22, I mean, that solidifies him as an RB two, which is a second year player that was really, you know, kind of a bench player last year. That's probably around where, where he should be. I have him in our uh, media dynasty league. So obviously I'm hoping for big things uh, from him. Stefan Diggs, wide receiver. He's fourth among in the Yahoo rankings, Jefferson, Jamar Chase, and Tyreek Hill out of them. That sounds right. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, somebody took Garrett Wilson six overall. I'll say with Aaron Rodgers as his quarterback, I can see Garrett Wilson having a Stephon Diggs type season. Yeah. I mean, and listen, you talk about Diggs at four. I think it's, you can throw Devonte Adams into the conversation. Mm -hmm. People are high on Chris Olave, Garrett Wilson, of course. I mean, here's a, a CD lamb, the guy that you had in your league that we had touched base on before. Like you want to get one of those top wide receivers. Right. And so for him, you know, anywhere in between being wide receiver one and wide receiver 10, you can make a case for, and it's really no, um, it's no disrespect to him. Right. If Cooper cup was healthy and you took him before Stefan Diggs, I'm not going to bat an eye at it. I'm not going to bat an eye. If you take Stefan Diggs before or after Devontae Adams. So sure. there's a lot of talent out there, but I'll say this. I like kind of the fire that Diggs has had through training camp, even mm -hmm. just seeing him in limited preseason. Whatever the hell it was that's going on, he's always played with a bit of a fire, but um, I expect another great year from him too. Gabe Davis, 36 among wide receivers, 83rd overall. Um, guys ahead of him include Marquise Brown, Christian Kirk, DeAndre Hopkins. I don't know, 36 sounds reasonable to me. That's a upper half of a wide receiver, too. Well, yeah, I mean, among the NFL, in terms of fantasy football, if you got a 12-team league, he's a wide receiver three, pretty much, I, I'm most teams. Sounds about right. Hmm? Listen, if you remove uh, the Kansas City Chiefs playoff game from two years ago from the equation, that's probably where Gabe Davis is drafted last year. And last yeah. year, he ended up being like a borderline wide receiver too, which he probably shouldn't have been. But there was a projection of just like, look what this guy can be, the preseason hype around the Bills. Now I feel like he's undervalued a little bit, right? We talk about the high ankle sprain from last year, what he can be. Um, you know, it's tough though. I assume for you, for me, like I do too many drafts with Bills fans. So it's, you know, you're not... People like Gabe Davis. If you're in an auction or a draft, they're, they're taking him a little bit earlier than maybe if you're with folks that, that don't follow the Bills. But when you have Bills fans in every draft that you do, it's it's hard to get him at, uh, at a little bit of a sleeper pick, which I feel like he he will be this year. I got him in two of my three leagues. He's in, I got him in my friends league, and I have him in a, our media uh, dynasty league. Tight end. So Dawson Knox is 25th among tight ends. Sounds reasonable. Dalton Kincaid, this surprised me a little bit. He's already 11th among the tight ends, 112 overall. So he's a borderline starting tight end in fantasy. If you've got a 12-team league, 10 to 12-team league, he's going to be starting on a, on a lot of fantasy teams. Does, does that surprise you a little bit? You know, let, let me say this. It doesn't surprise me because when you talk about 11 and a half personnel, people will start thinking, okay, he's going to be more than just a tight end. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's filling the void left by Cole Beasley. Look back at the stats from a couple years ago. Okay, here's a guy in Beasley that was getting, what, seven, eight targets a game. Like you just think about the the volume that the Bills have in the passing game and how last season they missed that layup in the middle of the field right and for dalton kincaid to be that guy here's the thing you, i would look at it and think to myself gosh maybe they're going to kind of ease him in this season might start a little bit slow but when we were talking about the jets and you talk about question marks like their linebackers and coverage i think that is the weak spot for them so week one could end up being like a breakout dalton kincaid type of week that mm -hmm. could be a little bit interesting as far as you know maybe 
living up to the hype, but exceeding the expectations and then things kind of falling back to earth. I do think Dawson Knox at 25 is a ridiculous sleeper. I mean, from that, that's a, a tight end that's not even drafted. Seven touchdowns last year, you know, an off season in 2022, completely understandable based on the, you know, family situation and the passing of his brother, Luke, right before the start of the season. Um, I would expect this to be a really good year from Dawson Knox. So I feel like people are sleeping on him way too much um, at this time. Yeah. I mean, you're talking tight end 25, which means he's probably the tight end two on most fantasy teams. You know, Kincaid being 11, he, he, he could still be a good value because he, early on guys like Pitts and Waller, and of course, Kelsey will go in the first round of every draft, but those guys are getting taken in the second or third, no later second or third round Kittle, whereas Kincaid's probably going around five, six. So he's filling out a starting roster for a lot of teams, you know, that you're, but you're getting them later in the draft and potentially he could have a uh, great production. Tyler Bass is the third kicker. Tucker and, and Carlson are ahead of him and the Bills were fourth in defense behind Frisco, Dallas, and Philly. The only reason why I'd be a little bit worried about the Bills defense is just because how many great teams they play. You know, yeah. they're in a tough division and, uh, you know, they play Kansas City and they play Cincinnati and they play the Chargers. So I'm not that high on the Bills defense for fantasy football purposes just because of their uh, their schedule. Well, I get that too. And Von Miller missing those first four games, that changes sure. the equation at least early on. But, you know, I could see somebody dropping the Bills to, you know, be in a bye week or something along those lines if they get off to a, a subpar start, at least from a fantasy standpoint and somebody that you can then grab on the waiver wire. Mm -hmm. All right, let's wrap up with our uh, finish the sentence segment. Each time I have Anthony on. I ask him four questions. I really don't have much or anything to do about sports. Just an opportunity for anyone watching or listening to uh, get to know a little bit more about us, our personal side. Um, let's get this going here. All right. First one, a celebrity I can't stand, even if everyone else likes them, is blank. Johnny Depp. And this has nothing to do with any of the, the legal stuff he went through. I'll be honest with you. I didn't even follow any of that. So I couldn't even share any of those details. But uh, pretty much since he left 21 Jump Street, like uh, that was the last time I probably liked anything that Johnny Depp was in. So for me, it's just I, I never saw the appeal. I never thought he was a great actor. I just there was yeah. just something about him. And there's not many celebrities that I you know, to say I can't stand, I mean, that's probably even too strong of a term for him, but that was the person that popped to mind. That's a good one. I never thought of that one, but I could have seen myself taking that one. And he's a musician who gives a shit though, too. You know what I'm saying? By the way, if, if you want to know more of what happened with Johnny Depp and uh, Amber Heard, Netflix has a new documentary out. I, I watched it like in the background where I wasn't paying attention. And then it just, I literally didn't pay any attention. So I only watched it in theory. Um, that's a good one. I'm going to go with Jerry Seinfeld. And I, I you know, I don't think he's that fun. I don't think he's that funny. Uh, I think he's a pretty lousy comedian and an all time show. Seinfeld's an all time show. And I liked it, yeah. but he was the clear weak link to me in that cast. Um, I liked the other three way more than I liked Jerry Seinfeld. In fact, Jerry Seinfeld is the reason why I didn't watch Seinfeld in the 90s for a lot of years because he, his voice, he just annoyed me. Eventually, I went back and I rewatched, you know, I watched, I binged the whole series, I ended up loving it. It's a great, it's one of my all time favorite shows. But it ain't because of Jerry Seinfeld, it's because of, because of George and Elaine and Kramer, not because of him. Don't like Jerry Seinfeld. I didn't have a guess where you would have gone, but I think if you gave me a hundred guesses, I never would have guessed Jerry Seinfeld for you. Really? So. Yeah, not, not a big Jerry guy at all. All right, so this next one that I got coming up here, we kind of did this a couple weeks ago, and you reminded me of that. Now, here's the question. The dumbest thing slash trend I can remember from my childhood is, now, we did this, again, a couple weeks ago, and we both kind of went with something to do with how our hair was done, you know, getting shit shaved in our... Uh, lines and stuff like that shaved in our head. So I'm kind of, this is a, at least a semi repeat. And I'm asking this selfishly because something came up that I saw a photo of that made me start thinking about this. <laughs> I remember being a kid. So, I mean, you can still use the same answer technically if you want to, but, but what's the, no, dumbest I'll, you can I'll use something, I'll use something different. And I don't even know if I'll call it the dumbest thing, but it's certainly a dying art in the, the day and age of, uh, of caller ID and, you know, your number flashing wherever you're mm -hmm. calling from. 
but just uh, the prank phone calls, right? Whether it was calling a, <laughs> a friend from school or calling a pizza shop or, yeah. you know, whatever it, whatever it might be, you know, you're sitting around with one or two of your friends and you, you think you're doing something and you're disguising your voice. And, you know, some people would get mad at you when, when you would do that, when in reality, it's like, you know, some people would, would play along and they'd get a kick out of it because they knew you were a kid and you were just being, being stupid. So, you know, I, I just think it's, uh, it, it's something that, uh, kids these days, they won't get to, uh, to experience. And of course, in a day and age where you got so many, so much weird stuff going on, where you check your email with spam or phishing or social media and these types of things sure. were just this, this weird piece to it. But, you know, Back in the day, kids, before that stuff was around, you know, your dad and his buddies used to make some prank phone calls and we thought we were hysterical. So. Yeah, that's a good one. I never thought of that. And it makes me think, and this is not my answer, but another one would be, I remember some friends and I, we used to actually go walk up to people's porches and ring their doorbell and run. We used to think that was the coolest thing. So stupid. Ding I wasn't ditch. that fast, was so we didn't do a... We didn't do a lot of ding door ditch. I'm not, uh, I wasn't that quick, so. Uh. <laughs> Here's mine. And I can't believe that this was ever a popular thing when I was a kid. And I don't know if this, like when you grew up, if this was a thing. Do you remember candy cigarettes? Oh, sure. Oh my God. Think about this. When you're a kid, they are marketing cigarettes, candy cigarettes, like sugar that look like, you know, sticks that are literally, and I remember being a kid and pretending I was smoking, man. You go to the store, you pay 25 cents or whatever. And you get a pack of Marlboro candy cigarettes. Are you kidding me? You have fucking kids walking around pretending that they're smoking cigarettes to be cool, man. You got to be crazy. Listen, man, it was so different back then. And, and full disclosure, you guys know I work for the American Cancer Society. If yeah. you follow me on Twitter, you'll see different things I put out there. Um, you know, even back in the day of like, you know, you'd go to, you know, a baseball game and it's like, oh, it's. Joe cool, uh, t-shirt giveaway night or candy cigarettes or all these things. Like it was a lifestyle that was like glorified in so many ways, but yeah, candy cigarettes, we would walk up to Casper's, uh, grocery. I'd, I'd still remember as a kid and, you know, you would get the, and you would never, you would think nothing, nothing of it. Right. It was just this like, oh, your parents like, oh, do you want candy cigarettes? Like, yeah, sure. I'm five years old. Like why, why not? So, Isn't it the, like the, the craziest, worst, most dangerous marketing scheme ever? Like you made kids think that smoking was cool. I can't wait till I'm old enough that these candy Marlboros can become real tobacco Marlboros. It just, uh, I don't know, that shit just blows my mind. What a dumb thing. That, that's something that, you know, sometimes I, I, I hate how we can't like watch TV shows that we enjoy when we were younger. They can't get made in today's society. But this is one thing that I'm glad can't be part of today's society. You know, peer pressure and influencing kids to try candy cigarettes, man. You got to be kidding me. It's just, uh, <laughs> it's nuts. All right. By the way, this is like the grumpy segment of Finish the Sentence. All this negative shit here. And there's more to come too. Uh, all right. Two more. Something I like less and less the older I get is blank. Oh my God. I felt like there were so many things I could answer with this. It's like, my God, you are turning into a stinking curmudgeon. We're curmudgeons. But I will, I will say this, um, staying in hotels and, you know, mm. for work, I have to do some travel. And when I was younger, it would be like, oh, I'm going to this, you know, I'm going to New York city or I'm going to be in Boston or this and that. And just like the idea of, oh, being away in a hotel for, for a night, right? Like now it's just like, no, I would rather like drive home, sleep in my own bed. Like, yeah be be comfortable right versus that like whatever sort of piece and i'm not talking about like you know if i'm on vacation with my family or a weekend getaway like of course i enjoy those things but like you know and some will you know say like hey being in a hotel room king size bed by yourself for a night like you know peace and quiet it's like it's not peace and quiet like you can never get the temperature right somebody's always making noise in the room next to you or above you or below you or whatever it is like it sucks. So for me, yeah. the older I get, like, yeah, I don't, I don't need it. And plus the pillows always suck. So there's that <laughs> part. So to me, it's like, yeah, take your hotel. I don't care if it's like a fancy hotel or whatever. I'd rather just sleep in my own bed. I'm going to go with like all the old people's, you know, greatest hits, drinking, music, staying up late, 
My eyesight's getting crappier, harder to lose weight, et cetera, et cetera. But out of all them, I probably would say hip hop. I just grew up loving music in the 80s and 90s, hip hop music, man. I, I couldn't get enough of it. I was obsessed with hip hop music. And there might be, uh, you know, an artist or two or a song or two in recent years that, that grabs my ear. But for the most part, the auto tune stuff can't freaking stand hip hop anymore. And I'm, it hurts me to say that because, again, I am such an old school classic hip hop guy. So uh, that one's tough for me. And, and I'll, go, I'll go with that one. All right, last one here. A place you never want to visit again is blank. Well, and it sums up a bunch of things that you said before. Um, I'll say New Orleans, right? Been mm -hmm. there a couple of times. Um, fun, some great food, like a lot going on. But at this point in my life, it's just like, yeah, I don't... I don't need all that, right? When you think about just being down in the French Quarter area and it's just like any sort of debauchery, it's like I've I've done that before. It was great to see, but you know, if I'm if I'm looking to go someplace like that's I I'm good. <laughs> Mine is I never been to New Orleans by the way, so I I got nothing to uh to compare that to or, or nothing to add to it because I've never been there. So, um I'm going to go with a place I never want to visit again is any legitimate haunted house. Oh. Those scare the shit out of me. Fun fact about me. I am one of the most jumpy, easily scared people that you're ever going to meet in your life. And I'm um, as old as I am. If I go to a haunted house or I psych myself into going to one, I won't last 25 seconds before I'm turned around. The first time I get scared whatsoever I turn around, I go against the traffic, I go against the gray, and I get my ass right back out of there. Horrified of haunted houses. So I highly doubt you'll ever see me visiting uh, a haunted house again. You're gonna, losing all those sponsorships of the show from the haunted houses around <laughs> Buffalo that would be looking to do a promotion, but I understand why. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that is going to do it uh, for today's episode. Make sure you follow Anth on Twitter, at Anth Marino. And again, Check out, it'll be on his Twitter. I'll put it in the show notes as well. The charity pick them contest that they got going on. Great stuff. Big week, man. Next week, next time we talk, we'll be talking um, some actual regular season Buffalo Bills and NFL football, man. Can't wait. Let's get it. All right, guys. Talk to you. Talk to you. You know what? I was going to say we'll be back with another episode tomorrow, but I don't even know that. So talk to you soon enough, guys. Take care.